Brian Powell of I Run Far here with Carl Meltzer after his record-setting run of the Appalachian Trail. Yeah, First off, congratulations, jump. Carl. Yeah, thanks. It's a good feeling to get it done after three times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, have, uh, you have done this three times, and now you finally have done this. You've had about a month to reflect. How does it feel? Uh, well, it feels successful, finally. You know, I mean, to do it three times and do all the recon, all the work I put into it, it you know, it would have been a bummer not to really come out of it ahead, but... Uh, Feels good. I'm not, I don't have to run for a month. I haven't run, haven't run a step in a month. So I'm chilling out, relaxing, uh, trying to enjoy life and Bernie here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it feels great to finally have the record. And But, you know, at the same time, it's going to go down. I think depends who does it, of course. You're going to need someone to stout record either way. But uh, it's it's breakable. I had some slow days, so Yeah. Breakable. Now, yeah, there's so many things to talk about. I mean, I guess you've been doing this, yeah, three times. And it wasn't just that. You... Did tons of reconnaissance, mm -hmm. ton of play. I mean, you seem like a totally laid back guy, but when you get into something, yeah, you, yeah. you're like low key in outward presentation. But yeah, I mean, when we we thought about it in 2015, uh, Red Bull came to me with the idea of like, hey, Carl, you want to do the AT one more time? And I was like, actually, they came to me in 2014, right after I bailed out, and I was like, no way, am I going <laughs> back? But but uh, you know, time passed by a little bit, and then we talked about it again in February, and. We said, well, if we do it, let's not do it in 2015, let's do 2016, because you can do more recon, you can, Carl, just do what you need to do to get it done, which mm -hmm. was really cool. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. So I went to the East Coast on in 2015 in September, did all of Maine, reconned it like the way it's supposed to be done. <laughs> um, the other times I didn't do it right. And then this time, so I did that, and then I came home, and then I went back in March to develop the southern part. Uh, I, I really kind of watched my crew too, so mm -hmm. they knew where they were going and stuff like that. And just me knowing the trail, being on the trail, just made me feel better about it and more confident, especially the main part. Um, Which I, the first time around was first time around was a nightmare with the water. I mean, that's just a whole other story. Second time. Um, on day one, we really didn't go far enough. We went to a place called Nanakano Lake Stream, which is 42 miles in. This time we went to 56 miles of Joe Mary Road, which made a huge difference. It doesn't sound like that much of a difference, but it sets you up for future days. It's 14 miles out of 2,200. Like It doesn't sound like much, but but the way Maine is, um, my idea was to get a lot of sleep. So I slept seven or eight hours a night. And by doing that that first day, I was done that day at 7.30 in the evening. So uh, I slept well, and all of Maine was like a cakewalk, which sounds crazy, but... Maine was not that hard for me this time, and that really set me up and gave me a lot of confidence. And it has been hard. It's always, I mean, it's hard. It's a tough, it's a tough trail in Maine, but you do it, if, more times you do things, the easier things get. It's like any race, it's like Hard Rock, it's like Wasatch, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, so I was really confident going into it. I was in better shape. Uh, my crew was better. They were, we had a really, Eric Bells was awesome. I mean, he went to me with the recon efforts too. So he was also there, not just to like jump in at the end. He also saw all that part and pieces mm -hmm. of it. So he was ready, I was ready, my dad was ready, and Cheryl was ready. Um, and that was really, between the three of them, that was pretty much most of my crew. Scott Jurek helped at the end, which was, we'll talk about it in a minute, but yeah. um, again, monumental 10 days he had there, but, uh, and Mike Mason. And other than that's five people, all, you know, Dave Horton showed up, of course, but uh, of course. Probably to heckle more than. Yeah, he heckled, <laughs> but he gave me some inspiration. <laughs> good, talk, good. He tried to push me to go further sometimes, but I didn't want to. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, between that was it. And with another thing we did too, like most people know that we didn't post, um, live right away. So people didn't really fault, weren't able to really find out where I was. And that was just because I like to do things for myself, mm -hmm. nothing against anyone running with me, but, uh, it, it made the crew also focus more on the objective mm -hmm. as opposed to being chatting with, uh, people and stuff like that, taking pictures and stuff. So did they you get, did help get into a rhythm for everybody. Yeah, everybody was totally in a rhythm. It was take it out of the van, put it in the thing, put it back in the van, go to the next stop. And it was like 232 crew stops later, it was over. <laughs> That's how many it was. Uh, Eric counted those up at the end. But uh, but they were in a very good routine. And that was, you know, this time I was more focused than ever. And I didn't want anything to like, you know, throw a wrench into the engine or something like that. So having more people around was much better. Having less people around was better. And, you know, every night I went to bed within 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to, to before things start... Uh, obviously over the last couple of years, you have had a couple injuries. Mm -hmm. Um, how was your prepar your physical preparation going yeah. into this? Well, my last race was the Sonoma 50. So that was early April. And I swore, I know I didn't swear. I said I wouldn't race after that to really prepare for the AT. Mm -hmm. So I really hiked around a lot more. I, I'm around the Wasatch and around anywhere, um, anywhere else. I was more hiking, learning how to, teaching myself to walk a little faster. Mm-hmm. 
you can walk like 3.7 miles an hour. That's pretty fast. Um, and I had all those calculations in my head, but I really trained and I didn't, I kept myself um, healthy, you know. 2014, I went, went to run Western. I dropped out after 80 miles. I was pretty hammered. Started a month later. Wasn't really ready. Uh, in 2008, you know, I was ready in 2008, but I just wasn't, didn't do all the recon. I didn't really know the trail that well. This time, I was super fit when I started, and I just stuck to my game plan, you know. And that's that's what really paid off is really the crew was right and then stick it to my own plan. And it was your own plan. You started in the north. Right, right. And right. some other attempts have gone from the south. Like Scott's record yeah. was from the south. What? And it, you've always gone from the north. Yeah. So what's the reasoning behind well, that? Well, in 2008, we went from the north because that's the way the record was set. Andrew Thompson had it southbound. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was like, well, we'll do it the same way he does it. So I knew it southbound. Uh, and then 2014, Jen Farr, when she broke it, I think in 2011, she went southbound. Okay. So then I go southbound. <laughs> Um, Scott went northbound because he wanted to do it, um, apparently, because uh, it's more traditional the way hikers do it, mm -hmm. which is cool, you know, nothing wrong with that. Do I think it's what's harder or easier? It's hard to say, but it can work both ways again against you either way. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, getting the hard stuff out of the way, harder terrain anyway, you know, Maine and New Hampshire, the whites are ridiculous. Uh, it's kind of nice to finish. Like, I finished 85 miles this time, and it was, if I would I never would have finished 85 miles in Maine. <laughs> So it's a different, different way to look at it. It's a better way to finish going southbound, I think. Now, starting out, you get in a rhythm. Um, it's hard to compare paces. I mean, you had, what, you had where Jennifer was, but you didn't have where the current record holder right. was. So how did you keep yourself sort of on yeah. track? Well, I kept myself on track, mostly. Um, think about it. I mean, Jen, Jen was three hours off Scott, right? Yeah. So three hours translates to 10, uh, 10 miles pretty easy to check it out. So I was right on Jen's itinerary. That's I wasn't even looking at Scott's. Trying to do those <coughs> calculations in my head was not worth my time. You didn't need to. Yeah. Didn't need to. So, I, you know, as I went along, um, we stayed right on Jen all the way through uh, Gorham, New Hampshire. So that's day, end of day seven. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, she struggled a little over my Washington. She slept on the peak and in an engine room and slept a few hours. So she was tired she had a bad time her shin was starting to hurt so i sort of took advantage of when she had her bad days which is like five or six days in um, new hampshire vermont so i went over my washington went to Crawford notch and then i was like I, I would call it record pace 12 minutes or 12 miles ahead of record pace and i just kept track of it there mm -hmm. my following day after that i was a little bit low in miles i was only 28 but i was tired <laughs> going over wildcat ridge and the prezies in one day is ridiculous um but it paid off, you know, it put me in a good spot. And then, and to think about all that too, uh, it did not rain on me till after Mount Musalak when it gets, when the train gets better in New Hampshire. Nine days, no rain. That sounds Hampshire. ridiculous. You know, you, you just, you know, 2,190 mile yeah. effort and you're talking about a 28 mile ridge and that ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, so it's not just the enormity of the effort. No. There are the little pieces. There are, are pieces of that where you, that are just, Maine and New Hampshire are so ridiculous, and it's not just the elevation gains, which are big. They're as big as they are out west here, um, in a lot of places. And but the terrain is much more technical, so you just move slower. Mm -hmm. Not one day did I average four miles an hour, maybe some pieces, but three point four was like the average. That's painfully slow, <laughs> but it's not on the AT, you know. So that's something that you kind of have to think about. I mean, I can look back to every day and say why this was hard and why it wasn't, but. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, it's 46 days, so you just have to get up every morning and do it again and, and deal with it. Now, some people who've done long efforts sort of feel that they run into it. Like after a week or two or something, you kind of physically, some of the little stuff goes yeah. away and you just start stronger or more solid or more used to it or whatever. Yeah. Did you feel that at all? Well, generally, I, mean, I was in good shape when I started. And mm -hmm. I was hiking around Maine and New Hampshire, actually, for eight or nine days before I even started it again, just to get, just to get on that techie jump mm -hmm. terrain. And I think that also helped a little bit um, in terms of we might getting into my run. Uh, I was, but it's true, you get your legs after two or three weeks on something like that, especially when you're just hiking and not mm -hmm. running. You just, you get that stride and you've got that, once you get out of the junky terrain, you can move a little faster. Um, you know, it's ironic, everything was for me was on cue. I was a day ahead of Jen's record pace yeah. after 18 days. I mean, I was cruising and I wasn't even, it wasn't like I was really working hard to do that. I was working hard, but I wasn't. Uh, you weren't burying yourself. I wasn't killing myself. Yeah. No, I wasn't burying myself at all. And then my shin break goes down on a grassy swill on a flat grassy area. And then I had, then I had struggles in Pennsylvania. Um, but I had time to get back. 
it's not my idea to put time in the bank in a race, but yeah. But I had I had 50 miles in the bank, so to speak. So I had I was able to give time back and not really get too too discouraged. So I, you know, I stayed close to where she was and just said, you know, probably not out of it. And I was definitely more focused this time. Now, from the outsider's perspective, there definitely seemed a point in there where like, shit, Carl, Carl ain't gonna make it. Like, yeah. I imagine after my my <laughs> I imagine after my uh, let's see, after my 32 mile day was. I'm, I'm way ahead, and all of a sudden, 32 miles, they go, whoa, you've, you've lost 20 miles or so. And then I had a, a painful but 50-something mile day, which was fine, and then a 16-mile day, yeah. which everyone was thinking, like, oh, it's over, he's out. But Especially two days after. Especially right? two days after. And like, so my and my shin was on fire. I mean, I was just like, you know, I didn't say to myself, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just, I, all I said to myself, let's do what we can to make it get better, mm-hmm. instead of thinking negative all the time. And my crew never got negative either. Okay. So that was really a positive thought. And again, I had time in the bank. So even after that 16 mile day, I was still seven miles ahead of record pace. So I wasn't out of it, you know. I was just hoping that uh, so anti-inflammatories would kick in, which they, I guess they did. And then a few days later, um, I was able to muscle through it. When did you feel like you got back in that in a rhythm, like? Yeah, well, uh, so that lasted all of Pennsylvania. You know, the funny thing is, I fear Pennsylvania because it's just ugly. It's rocky. It's uh, like ridiculously rocky. It's um, it's. It feels dirty in a way. It's kind of a weird, weird feeling in Pennsylvania. Like it's the it's a tough, nasty part of the trail, and I, I don't really fear it, but it's like you just want to get through it because it's ugly. So anyway, we're going through Pennsylvania, and that's when I went back and forth with my big and my 50 mile days, 16, 32, stuff like that. Got to Dun Cannon, and we stayed at the most ghetto campground I've ever stayed in my entire life. Uh, it's another story in itself, but <laughs> we don't have to go there. But at the same time, we stayed there. I talked to Jerick on the phone that day, and he suggested doing one thing with a compression wrap on my shin. And I can't really say that that was a game changer, but um, it was basically putting the compression over the belly of the muscle, which helped the tendon release a little bit. So it, whether that helped or not, I walked out of Dun Cannon, and uh, I got up a hill. It's about a two-mile hill. And... Had a little wrestle with a possum that was running down the trail, which is pretty funny. <laughs> Things I remember, right? But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, weird. But I started jogging uphill a little bit. Uphill didn't hurt much. Okay. Downhill is like when you when you stretch your your foot out like this. So is one interior tibialis or? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It was right here. So when you were slapping a little bit. Or when I slapped, it would just I'd be on fire. Yeah. But I started jogging uphill. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't feel too bad. And I started jogging downhill a little bit and. Didn't feel too bad. And right after Duncannon, the terrain gets easier. You get a place called Cumberland Valley. Then you have Maryland. You have Virginia, Shenandoah. All those areas are pretty smooth. Mm-hmm. So I bumped into a through hiker that was going north. And he's like, he's like, hey, Carl, hang in there, you know. And he knew what was going on. However he knew, I don't know. But he knew. And he's like, it's getting smoother, man. You'll heal right in the smooth terrain. I left Duncannon. I put in 53 miles. And I was, I was done at like 7 o'clock or 6.45 that evening. And I could have gone further, but I'm like, don't push it. <laughs> I could have gone a seven mile, seven mile leg and been 60. Mm-hmm. But I waited and said, tomorrow we'll go 60 because it, it's fit in right there. I went 53, then I went 60, then I went 57, and then boom, I'm back ahead of Jen again. You know, I was eight miles behind Jen and Duncan. Mm-hmm. So then all of a sudden I was seven miles ahead again. And then I went over the priest and three ridges. My, my shin pain was gone. Mm-hmm. Like, it's gone. So you're running in Virginia and you're good? Yeah, I was good. I mean, it, it, it was still stiff. It's still even a little stiff now. Now, Jen made good progress mm-hmm. all through that. All through that. Uh, I mean, did it feel like you were racing her? I mean, because you had a, there was a stout comparison every day. Totally. How did I was racing Jen feel? for sure. I was yeah. looking over my shoulder like this all the time. I mean, for sure. I mean, you, you, you have this thing where you're, you're thinking of the virtual reality of like, She's either behind you or ahead of you because you're looking at her itinerary. So it's like the two of us are sort of on the trail at the same yeah. time. Uh, it's pretty weird. It's pretty weird I, how that happens. Um, but yeah, I was racing her the whole time. And I knew all I had to do was stay on her pace and throw down any miles in the last day and I got it. Because her last day, she didn't do that. So and you kind of had, was... had like, that was the wild, not the wild card, but that was your trump card. Just... Well, it totally was my trump card. She, she 53 and 52. I want to put it in there. Uh, let's give him one more chance. Right. Hey guys, settle down, <laughs> <laughs> Bernie. Uh, so, so yeah, so I'm, so I'm sort of racing her, and again, she didn't. She slept that last night, like five, just like five hours, but she slept. That's, that's five that's, hours. That's five hours. So I knew that I was. If all I had to do was stay even with her, and I was fine. So as I progressed southbound, 
I had that one bad day by McAfee Knob where I slept in the woods. People saw the picture of me sleeping on the trail. <laughs> it was only 20 minutes. <laughs> it wasn't all night. Um, but, but regardless of that, that was a horrible day. I just, I woke up that morning on the trail in a tent and I don't know, I didn't sleep very well. And that's always a big key for me. I don't do well with sleep deprivation, but uh, I just couldn't move. I went 10 miles in five hours and it was like, you know, terrible, horrible. So I slept in the van a couple hours in the afternoon or the late morning. And then I got up and wandered, wandered off on the trail. My crew didn't know where I was. I left without my spot locator and stuff. I was just kind of bummed. Um, I wasn't really bummed. I wasn't really behind, but I was I was bummed that my body wasn't feeling better, you know? Mm-hmm. But I kind of, I, I went, got through that day, 32 miles. Dave Horton kept telling me to go seven more. Go seven more. You get seven more. You get a hit of gin, three miles. I'm like, Dave, I'm going to sleep tonight. <laughs> so I just slept. And the next morning I woke up and I was still a little grumpy. But... I said, Carl, you got to turn the switch. And so I did the switch off, the mean switch. I called it the mean switch because I was being a little grumpy. <laughs> and uh, and I continued on. And I knew, you know, as I was going along, again, I was like, I was right where I needed to be. I wasn't pushing it, but I was where I needed to be. And that's all that it took. I knew the last day was going to be big. Now, yeah. did flipping the mean switch off help you as much as it- Helped your crew? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, like I got to the I got to the aid station that first day after after the, the terrible day, and I said, "All right, the mean switch turned off, you guys." My dad's like, "Oh, thank God." <laughs> <laughs> and but he's funny. He just let it blow. They both of them, him and Eric, will let it blow right over their head, like nothing, like you know, whatever. And that's part of it is you have to deal with those things too. Now, and, is that uh, something that has come like wisdom that's come with age and experience? Because you you have that intensity and that. Coming yeah. through a checkpoint in a race, you can be. I can be, you know, I. It's, it's just, focused. It's not like you're like. It's it's what's funny about it is that like so my crew is there. They're waiting for hours, two yeah. or three hours every day. Every two hundred thirty-two stops, right? They're waiting, and when I come in, it's like, and I'm out there two or three minutes every time. Yeah. I would sit down, and do a couple things, drink some ultrajin, and eat a little food, pack my little pouch, and I'd be out. And I, it was intense, you know, those three minutes. And sometimes I forget something, but then. I'd walk off. I'm like, oh, God, I gotta apologize again. <laughs> but, but it wasn't all the time. Yeah. But but they they were. I mean, never did we bark at each other or anything like that. Um, no one was walking off the crew. Or... No one was walking off the crew. Um, no one was getting kicked off the crew. It was they stayed money. You know. I mean, I know they were ready to be done with two weeks to go, of course. But um, you know, my dad and Eric Bell's they bounced off each other really well, so they get along great. Mm-hmm. So that was that was a bonus for me to see their positivity all the time. Like not once were they like negative with each other or anything like that. That's awesome. So that made everything. Like, so that crew, crew is huge. I mean, in a way. I mean, yeah, it's me walking the miles, but yeah, without a without a happy crew, you're, you're, you're not so. a pacer guy, but a crew guy. Ooh. Yeah, a crew guy's tough, man. I mean, Bell's was so ready to be done, <laughs> but but all the way to the end, like he was still like even at the hotel in Atlanta. After it was all over, he was still kind of like crewing for me. You know, yeah. he was still doing this for me and doing that. I'm like, dude, your, your job's done, man. You're good. Now, you know? with a day to go, are you confident you're getting the record? Or are you? No problem. No problem. Because, because so I'm leaving on day 44. 40, after 44, I'm on my 45th day. So yeah. I, <laughs> had, I had 85 miles to go, and I had about 30 two hours or something something like that to get 85 miles and i'm like i get that no problem and physically you're okay i was money I negative- sleep, sleep deprivation we no. hadn't gone there yet no nope, i hadn't gone there at all i mean yeah. i didn't have to do that mm-hmm. so i slept eight, eight hours a night so maybe that's sort of an, an advantage a, a runner might have yeah i mean you're hiking a lot of it yes right. but like well yeah you're getting hiking. done getting done a little sooner going a little faster just allows you to stay up on well, for me it worked for me i mean i think scott when scott was just going northbound he was crawling because he was so sleep deprived he couldn't move you know i mean i don't know how jen probably was okay she was mm-hmm. just fired up but jen also had if she was racing virtual andrew thompson yeah. right she had a day on him so she didn't have to go all night she she could sleep and she still had it mm-hmm. so for her it was like she didn't you know she wasn't sort of rushed at the end i sort of had to throw that last one down you know, Jenny Jurek was like, why don't you take a nap for seven hours, you know? I was like, no, Jenny, I'm not, I'm not taking a nap. So she's like, make it interesting. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, well, I'm going to keep going. But, uh, yeah, it's – when I was at – it was a place called Deep Gap is where I started from with 85 to go. And I also did that in 2008 from the same place. Mm-hmm. So I was like, yeah, got it. Got it. But I negative split it too, which was pretty amazing. And were you, like, doing the calculations, like, every 10 miles? If I – all I have to do is go at this pace for the next – I was doing calculations from Katahdin. 
Yeah. I mean, when you're walking on a trail like that, you, you, you your calculations are running through your head all the time. And you're looking at your watch all the time. And I was racing the three mile per hour guy, so which is 20 minutes a mile. So yeah. every time a mile would click up on my watch. So you've got, got a 23 went, minute one. I've like, got a, I'm a 23. Oh, I fell behind three mile per hour guy. But but at the end of the day, it always would average 3.4 or something like that. Yeah. So like it was always coming out. It was with stops, so it was always coming out ahead. So yeah. all I had to do was race that guy 16 hours a day times three is 48 miles. You get it. You what know. did it feel like getting to the getting to the finish? It was and exciting. setting the record. Well, it was exciting to know that I succeeded. You know, yeah. I mean, I finally, I knew, I mean, I kind of knew I had it with 200 and from Davenport Gap with 230 to go because unless like, something happened bad, mm-hmm. you know, but uh, I mean, it was certainly was relief, you know, and many people say, well, what did you do afterwards? I'm like, well, I had a piece of pizza and a beer and I went to the van and went back to sleep. <laughs> when I woke up the next morning, I was like, well, I'm sitting in the van. Like, what do I do now? You know, but I mean, yeah, it feels fantastic. It, it goes by really fast. I mean, mm-hmm. When you're out there on the trail every day, you think like it's going to take forever to get to point B, but all of a sudden it's like you blink and the whole thing's over. No, I'm back in my backyard for a month already yeah. playing croquet. You know, it's like I'm back to reality. So, do you think you needed those first two attempts to do what you did this third time? I think the first two attempts helped a ton for sure. I mean, the, the recon that I did in Maine it lasted in September of 2015, and it, again, it seems like only six days makes doesn't make a difference, mm-hmm. but that gave me a lot of confidence in Maine. I the last two years, I really wanted someone with me when I was out there because it's a little more remote, more technical. You can get hurt. Um, but when I did the recon, I did it myself. I'm going myself. You know, I'm crossing the rivers myself and whatever. And it just then I went there and I was like, oh, this is a piece of cake. I got it. You know, so I was just so much more confident. Did your perspective change or your approach to the actual physical tasks either each day or the overall picture, like how you're going to pace your effort change in those three well, attempts? You don't, you, you don't really think about pacing. I mean, you just kind of take what it gives you, you know, like you're, you're going to hike. I mean, yeah, all you got to do is walk fast. You don't have to run. There's no, you don't push this section or push that section. You kind of just, it's really about getting from point A to point B each day. My goal was always to like get out of the van at five o'clock. 5 a.m. or better. Um, I didn't. I, I didn't miss that. One day I was 5:40. One day I was 5:20. Every other day I was before 5:07 or before. And I was money on that. I got up at 4:30 and I was out by five. And that was really important because the earlier I got out, I was just thinking in my head the earlier I get to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. So I was often going to bed by 8:30 at the latest. Did either through your approach or through what you requested or anything? Did it change the efficiency of your crewing from those first years to the end? Yeah, I, I mean, mean, I think so. I think Eric was just Eric was just so much more better, so much better. He he likes like he, this sounds silly, but he he made my bed every every day, and I looked in the van, everything was clean and neat and organized. In the morning, his the coffee was ready for the press. Everything was ready in line. Jet Boy was ready to fire. Like little stuff like that to me gave me confidence because it's just like. It's organized, you know. Mm-hmm. I hate this big mess. 2014 stuff was everywhere, and I'm just like that, ah, you know, telling the crew what to do, which I shouldn't have to do that. Yeah. So this, I mean, the efficiency, the efficiency of the crew is pretty, pretty freaking amazing. Now, there's a lot of fueling that goes on in something like this. You wake up in the morning, you have a cup of coffee. What are you throwing down? Yes. Yeah, so every morning I had yogurt. Um, I have 46, 40, 50, 60, 70 yogurts, and like maybe a banana, maybe something small. Hey, dogs. Uh, <laughs> but I ate a small breakfast. I didn't. I didn't have them cook, get up early and cook me a bigger breakfast. Not eggs and bacon. No, I, I, that would kind of come to the next stop. Like okay. I'd let them. What I would eat something like to get going out the door, start my walk, and then usually it would say eight, nine miles. They'd see me, and they would cook me something more substantial. I would usually take it to go, just eat it on the way out, and uh, I mean, but that was more efficient because in the other years I wanted them to make a breakfast, which means I had to get up earlier. And you're sitting there, and I'm sitting there and I'm eating. And why am I sitting here eating? I'm going to be walking. So it was like pounding yogurt down. I didn't have any feet problems. So you're not taking all that time to tape and. I had to do what I did. When I sat there in the morning. Eric had the tabs pulled on the two pieces of moleskin I had to get, like little things. And I, yeah. I was like bam, 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 and I might I could take care of my. Put my shoes on and my socks and my feet in three minutes. I mean, I was an hour in 2014 every time. And I guess 2008, for at least for a while, uh, it's same, same thing. Same thing in 2008. I was all the way to the bottom of the AT. So 
that was, I mean, think about one hour per day, 46, 46 hours, two days yeah. of time. So the feet thing was massive. It was a very dry year. I mean, things happened to me out there that I was really thinking like, this is, things are falling in place. And one, one thing I have to say in Maine on day three, it was showers around. I'm walking through the woods and it looks like it's gonna come to hit me. The very moment I stepped out of shelter where the trail goes right in front of it, it starts sheeting rain, pouring. I didn't want to get wet, my feet wet, right? I, it's pouring. I laid in the shelter for nine minutes. The rain stopped as fast as it started and I walked out and never got wet. <laughs> I went across every river in Maine dry except one and then there was crew a half mile after that where I changed my socks and shoes. Otherwise my feet were dry all the way. So that had a bit, bit of a factor in terms of my feet staying, staying strong. And not just time, but mental effort in terms of if you're dealing with foot issues, oh. like it's distracting and Do you want to walk with nasty, painful feet every single day for 46 days? No, <laughs> I didn't have that problem. I mean, I, I had another problem in uh, Virginia when John Basham showed up. Another story that's happened random. His wife is an ER doc. Um, that's another story, but he shows up because she had the day off. He's a stay-at-home dad, so he can't really just leave. Yeah. He ran, randomly has this day off. He comes out to see me and say hello. He identifies under my foot that I have a super deep blister as opposed to my neuroma. It feels just like my neuroma. Like painful. Like step on something. It's just like I would sit down like this, and I would have to hold my foot up in the air so it wouldn't throb. Oh. That's how painful it was. JB looks at it and he's like, oh, that's one of those deep blisters. Tomorrow morning, I'll bring a, a surgical needle, and we'll... We tried to lance it there, but we didn't know that much success. So he comes in the morning, 4 o'clock a.m., just like he says. I'm ready. We pull the fluid out. Foot never hurt again. If his wife would have worked that day, <laughs> So I there was like have... moment, like trail angel moments. Like, totally trail angel moments. Like, uh, those two those two times were, were just things that I remember off offhand, you know. But the, the thing when sticking my foot with the needle was money. I mean, my foot was super painful for a week before that. But he, that one thing, I mean, it was in three minutes, the pain was gone. What was your favorite moment on that? Or, or experience, if it doesn't have to be a single moment. Well, just, I mean, just the, I think maybe five or six days out when I knew I had it. Like, I mean, it's not really a particular moment, but mm -hmm. I'm like, I got this thing. You know, I actually don't fall apart now. And you got <laughs> it. But that was a really good feeling just to know, like, that I could also bounce back. I had a tough time in a place called Dennis Cove where I sort of bonked going in there and then I, and it's like, oh my God, you know, this, this could kill me because of the leg I had ahead of me. And then all of a sudden I bounced back again, which is like, ah, oh, you know, I, you can't, Dave Horton always said, doesn't always get worse. And I use that line a lot, but I mean, it didn't always get worse. You know, I, that was great in North Carolina. It was North Carolina about what that happened. And I was like, now I'm pretty confident I got it. You know, are you pretty confident that 2,200 miles isn't that hard? No, well, is. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a long way. <laughs> it's just a saying, you know. Yeah, I can't say 100 miles are not that far when I go on 2189 now. So, but it's, I mean, the AT is a daunting trail. I mean, it's it's so hard. I mean, what will I do next? I don't plan on going northbound. <laughs> um, I don't know what Scott plans on doing next. Uh, but it's it's great to have that record finally in the books. You know, I, obviously, I've been chasing it for eight or nine years. Would you say you're obsessed with it or we're obsessed with I'm it? I'm sort of obsessed with the stupid trail. I mean, it's I kept the going trail. back. It's the trail. It's the con it's the camaraderie of the people on the trail. It's the, the feeling you get walking through the tunnel. It's You don't get views hardly anywhere unless you get off well, off the trail a little bit. And I didn't go check out any views. Scott Jurek wanted me to go to the top of the tower on Clingman's Dome because he did. I'm like, I'm not going up there. <laughs> he's like, you know, when I saw him at the crew, he's like, did you go up the tower? I'm like, no. He's like, oh, I'm like... Dude, I'm trying to break your record, pal. <laughs> you know, I'm not going up the tower and wasting any time. Um, so I, you know, I spent no extra time looking around. Um, but the beauty is the tunnel. It's not the views. Uh, you like it green? That's that's the AT is the place for it. You know, it's and you, people walking, the, the people you see and you talk to briefly. I didn't talk to too many people either, but uh, it's it's pretty cool experience. You know. Now it's interesting you say that because. There, you know, are occasionally a small number of vocal sort of through hikers that just aren't pleased with the whole FKT thing. Okay, yeah. But in general, it seems like there's, it sounds like there's really good camaraderie and just your fellows on the trail. There's amazing camaraderie for sure. I mean, you, I mean I, I'd love to hike it just like a normal person one day, uh, just to kind of get that feel of the camaraderie. And like we all stink, you know, <laughs> none of us didn't take showers or nothing. It's killer. Uh, it's kind of fun. But the, the camaraderie is pretty amazing. I mean, 
I, I did see, talk to a lot of people, and those who wanted a photo, yeah, I took it, you know. But I wasn't out there to to, to tweet and blog and all this stuff. About you weren't it. hosting group runs on. No, that. I was not hoping group group runs. Uh, it was me about getting to Springer, and you know, talk about it later when it's over. What's your trail name? About speed show, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody knows that. But now you, uh, it sounds like one you haven't sworn off the trail because you thought about hiking it. Yeah, now no, yeah. the record has gone down a couple times in in the last couple years, yeah. and you, sounds like maybe jerk. I you know I, I think Scott has Scott has I mean I do too to have potential to do it faster. I yeah. think both of us do we want to do it again. I don't I doubt it. But the thing is, whether it was Andrew, Jen, myself, or Scott, or even Dave David Horton when he had it, and Peter Palmer, everybody had issues. Yeah, none of us nailed it. I nailed it for 19 days. Seriously, my first 19 days was like. I was like, man, if I just, I'm a, day, I'm a day ahead of Jen. All I have to do is through Pennsylvania stay even. That's all I wanted to do in Pennsylvania stay even and then just roll with it from there mm -hmm. and throw down the big last day. I would have done 44 and something. But things happen, you know. It all happened to all of us, so it definitely can be faster. And if somebody else shaved a couple minutes off the record, you'd consider going out there again? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm getting old. <laughs> um, ages and everything. But I, I don't know. It's hard to say, you know. Will, will That's they, not a no. It's not a no, but will the itch come back? I don't know. I, I think I, I got it once. I got it when I, I've had it, you know. And Scott yeah. said the same thing. Scott helped me. I helped him. I think I would help if there was someone. Think about Pete, Pete Kostelnik right now running across the country, right? He's killing it. And he's probably going to get that record for sure. Maybe he'll go after the AT. Mm -hmm. If someone like if he went after the AT next year or the following year, I'd be happy to help that guy. Yeah. Because I, I love being out there, you know. I like sleeping in my van and being on the trail and doing that kind of thing. So it'll be broken. I mean, it's not going to be broken by five days. It, but you can, there's a day or two to shave off, I think. <laughs> but again, it has to click, man. I mean, I was saying to Eric Bells, too, when I had those low days in Pennsylvania, um, I was, you know, falling behind a little bit. I said, I may, I may be having low days, but these are rest days, you know. <laughs> and I with positive, you know, I'm yeah. positive all the time. So... I was more rested when I got going again. I was able to throw down, you know, 53, 60, and 57 in three days So you're just burying yourself when you weren't be able to go. Right, just, right. I mean, it was funny on the AT, 60 miles is a lot further than 50. I, I mean, it's like, it seems like a whole other day. So it's, to go over 50 is, is big every day. Um, it's amazing how just a couple extra miles make a difference. When you're only going 17, 18 minutes a mile, it, it takes a while. Obviously, you've had a singular obsession on this this Appalachian Trail. Are there any other non-race goals that right. you have, um, or they, they, you know, they intrigue you? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe. I mean, I'd like to run across the winds, run across the winters and stuff. But those are short. I mean, yeah. hundred miles. They're not super long. But as far as super long trails, people ask me about the PCT all the time, and you know, to do that again, what does that require? I would want to do recon. Mm -hmm. You know, and it takes time and it takes money. Uh, I don't have the money for it anymore, <laughs> um, but it's a lot of the time, and I'm kind of running out of time in terms mm -hmm. of like being able to do that kind of thing. I mean, I'm 48, so it's like almost 49. So I don't think I'm getting much slower, but I don't know. I, I'm just going to roll with it and see what happens. I mean, I'm, I haven't run yet. Like, yeah, people ask, when are you going to run again? I'm like, when I feel like it. It could be next year. It could be December. <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of thinking like I might want to, but I'm like, eh, nah, I'm going to do something else in my house. I kind of it's been tooling around with something, something else, you know. Um, but it'll come back. I hope that the one good thing I can think positive, though, is that after all my three long runs, the Pony Express and the two AT runs, um, my following year of racing was pretty good. So yeah. <laughs> let's hope age 49 is solid. Point. Now you have any uh, races in particular you'd like to race next year? Well, I'd like to race Western, but I can't get in. I'm qualified. So uh, I didn't run a qualifier. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But I, that's another story. But I'd, I'd like to run Western when I'm 50. Yeah. So I will try to finagle my way, whether it's a qualifying race or, or even a sponsor exemption kind of thing. Um, try to get one on 50. Because that record at Western is it's 1843. And I know I can run 1843. Is that Rickman? No, sorry. I don't know, but it's old. It's a 30-year-old record. Oh, it's like, that old? Okay. It's their oldest record okay. that, on the books. And it's not about how old it is. I don't care if it was broken last year, but it's 1843, which I know I can run that at Western. I think we all know I can run that at Western. But you got to do it. But I got to get in. <laughs> I, well, I got to get in, it, first of all. Um, and that's a bit of a challenge these days. So if not, um, next year I'll probably run, once I get myself back together, I'll probably... 
do a couple hundred I've never done before. Really? Superior is one of my one I've been wanting to do because it's technical and it's kind of a cool area. Um, Cascade Crest is on the list. It's about the same time of year as one, you know. You gotta choose. Something different. I mean, I still haven't put my name in for Hard Rock yet. I don't know. But you still haven't? You still haven't decided not to? I haven't decided not to, but, you know, it, I've done it 10 times, 11 times. Um, you know, it's okay to move on. <laughs> watch, the, watch the younger kids go faster, so we'll see. You got some things you're looking forward to. I'm looking, I'm looking forward. At least I'm not looking back and say I'm retired. I'm going to go golf. I've been playing a lot of golf, but... Have you? Yeah, I have. I have been playing pretty well, too, actually. Think you can uh, lower your speed golf times next year? Uh, I would hope so. I, I, you know, I didn't. It just happened this last week. Um, speed golf world championships in Chicago. It just happened. You missed it. Well, I'm running pretty slow. <laughs> so <laughs> I, that's kind of the reason I didn't go is because my legs are so yeah, fried and you need to go fast. And, and uh, I really would have liked to play though. I saw the results and I was like, I, if I was ready, I could be in the money for sure. And uh, I'll play that again. And I'll do that, you know, 12 hour thing again, probably in April next year, just because that's fun. Yeah. Charity thing. So yeah, just play golf and hang out and Know, play winter croquet <laughs> now uh there's snow up in the the wasatch a little bit crest right there lose year again or no uh lose year is good when it snows a lot early yeah and this would be a good ideal year because i'm really not it actually gets me in shape to get running again so if it snows a lot in november december then maybe uh if it doesn't snow much then it's not really worth just because the way the sun goes down and stuff it's like it doesn't later in the season it firms up and gets soft this isn't as good the early season if it snows a lot maybe you can't really say for sure it's a lot of work obviously you put already putting a lot of work this <laughs> yeah I, and I, I focus more on it's kind of talk about cocaine but my buddies and i play cocaine in my backyard and, and we make this uh really cool winter court and we pack down the snow and it's like glass really smooth and the ball rolls like a pool table pretty fun when did it go from horseshoes to uh croquet uh, well, about two years ago. We still have the pits. Mm -hmm. The horse pits are still the sand bunkers now for croquet. But uh, yeah, it's it's croquet is more of a um, user friendly for anybody can play. You know, of course, users can be a little dangerous for some people. <laughs> Can't have kids running around. You know? Probably not. We aren't uh, horseshoes flying around. Yeah, or dogs. Dogs. Oh, Bernie. Bernie. Yeah, Bernie's. Bernie just started to take off. <laughs> All right. That's right. Um, you try to keep things simple. Uh, Gear-wise, what did you use out there on the 18? Uh, 19 pairs of Speedgo shoes. Um, they didn't all break down, but I just wanted new pairs all the time. Kind of like Fresh shit. feels good. Fresh feels good, exactly. Um, the Speedgo waste pack was from Ultraspire. I used that. It was a two-bottle pack, 18-ounce bottles. Um, I really didn't need much more than that. For about 13 miles, I can go about 13 miles on that. Mm -hmm. And I had a small pouch that was connected to that in the front, which is all, you know, a small pouch that Ultraspire makes. And uh, that's where I carried my food. And the bottles in the back, um, Speedgoat, Drymax socks, of course. I guess um, you don't need to carry a lot of extra clothing. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I never carried extra clothing. Even when it rained, it rained four days the entire time. But when it did rain, it wasn't cold. So I was running, running in just my, you know, actually Speedgoat race shirt most of the time. But just the, you know, Patagonia shirt. And you'd see your crew. Yeah. And what, you know, two or three hours later, if you really needed something. Right. And it, over my Washington, I carried a little more. Uh, but that's, I mean, generally... Um, that's it's really, I mean, that's about it. I poles? Didn't, didn't use poles. No poles. Uh, did not use poles. I, poles, I have a love-hate relationship with I, poles. I uh, mean, remember the first time you used Hard Rock? Felt like cheating. cheating. Felt like cheating, <laughs> and, and, and it kind of was. But but on the AT, um, when I did when I do use poles, I kind of use them, and I kind of put the top on my hand like that, and I push off them, sort of like mm -hmm. a fulcrum, and I drop them a lot, which is frustrating, because you're, and you're like, oh, I think I'm gonna go back and dry, pick it up, but, and then also I don't eat as much and drink as much when I'm carrying stuff, and it was more of a nuisance, so I didn't use them. Uh, I, and a lot of places, especially in Maine, New Hampshire, there's junky places where it's so rocky, they get stuck and caught. Pennsylvania, I did use poles when my shin was hurting, so for stability. So they worked there. Mm -hmm. But once I, the Just second- some BDZ poles. Yeah, some BDZ poles, and then, uh, but once I was, my shin was okay, I threw poles back in the van and I was done with it. Um, I just felt better without them. But, uh, what do you do for lighting? The, the, yeah, the lighting, I had a uh, black diamond sprinter. And so I was, so in the morning, I was dark for about an hour and a half, um, roughly. And the sprinter would last, but I'd carry an eye on a small one on my wrist, too. Always have two, always a fan of having two lights. And one, one morning... So well, you would use them for, like, at the same time, one for, like... Uh, not at the same time. Okay. It's really a backup, backup. the second one. Uh, 
the one morning, the one morning I left with just the sprinter, the one morning I did that, it, after 40 minutes and it was still dark, like just, just barely getting light out, the sprinter went out. And it just wasn't charged 100%. And, and I was like, oh, and I could, I could still see I actually survived it. Yeah. But um, take two. <laughs> Take two, you know. I'm like that second one would have made a difference, you know. Um, but that was that was. I'm trying to think of other stuff that I really used, and I mean, it was that simple. I mean, I didn't. I, I wore like, two different pairs of shorts like, the whole time. <laughs> um, I took five showers the entire time. Um, <laughs> not that you need to know that, but that's, the last. That's the la not a lot of showers. There's not a lot of showers. The last shower I took was in uh, Shenandoah National Park. So you um, did a good 18, 800, 18 days uh, without, I thought, how many miles out. was that? 18 days, 50 a day, 900. Eight, That's 18, a 900. lot of miles without a shower. Yeah, well, you know. How, like, I mean, having done that for some days in, in stage races or whatnot, it's fine. But sleeping after a while, didn't like. Yeah, you get used to it. So, and you're humid on the East Coast, which is not pretty. You're like, right? in the, you're sticky, you're in the sheets. So, so my, my comment to everyone was, well, if nobody takes a shower, nobody stinks we all stuff all the same so it didn't i mean seriously it was like you kind of and scott said the same thing we did is like you you, you want to clean off and you want that good feeling and it did feel great those few times of a dick shower but it was i'd rather sleep than take 15 minutes to take a shower so i was more focused on what i really needed to do as opposed to being dirty i mean i did when i stopped every night at the van i came in i sat down i cleaned basically from my knees down so I was cleaning my feet, you know, completely. I mean, I could have eaten off my feet because <laughs> um, that was that was something we did every day. But other than that, it was like, you know, brush your teeth, clean your feet, you're out of here. <laughs> so, now you listen to music when you run often. Yeah. Did you all the way? Always. Did you? Uh, did any song run out of favor? Did you just listen to one song way too many times? Like, <laughs> I could really need a break from this. Well, I had I had five iPods. Um, Three shuffles, uh, like a, a nano iPod, and uh, and another like Sandisk thing. Sandisk was Sandisk was different. The regular uh, nano iPod was different, and the three uh, shuffles were the same. Um, just because I, I kind of loaded music at the last minute, but uh, I mean, yeah, people ask me if I got bored on the trail. I think the only time I really got bored on the trail was when I go forward on a song. Like I'm sick with that song. <laughs> um, I listened to a lot of stuff. I mean, I really, I really didn't get sick of the same song all the time just because number one it was all new to me it wasn't like an old ipod i've been using for two years uh, okay. i put all new music so on it wasn't it. like your favorite jam band song and no just... and i've been listening to the same music for three years on my one ipod so <laughs> after i switched to new stuff it was like all new again so that was good um it went from acdc to the dead to john denver to neil young to johnny cash to... so it was a good mix it, it was wasn't... a different mix yeah i mean i you know, I'm from the 80s, do the math, Def Leppard was on there, uh, some junk like that, um, you know, but, but that's just what I like, so who cares, you know. Uh, it wasn't all dead, but it was, it was a lot of dead on there. Now, Scott Jerk, the former record holder, mm -hmm. did join you out mm -hmm. there. Um, what was your time like together? Well, Scott and I go back to 2001 when I first started, actually got to know Scott a little bit in Hong Kong, or 2002 in Hong Kong. Trail Walk, Oxfam. Trail Walker. Trail yeah, Trail Walker. Um, Old Montreal teammates. The old Montreal teammates, yeah. That was way back. Um, but, but Scott and I, we're good friends. We don't live near each other, so we don't hang out much. But when we do hang out, it's like he's a friend that you've known forever. You know, it's like one of those kind of guys. Um, so so he shows up, and I'm excited to, to, to go jog. He didn't really run with me much, you know. He was he was super focused on, like, crewing, which was which, which was his job, you know. Mm -hmm. He was there to crew. He wasn't there to, to run with me or pace me. Uh, but... But he he went to he helped, took a little load off Eric and my dad at the end because they were they were ready to be over it you know and Scott shows up and says I can meet Carl here I can run in here I can crew him here I can do this and Eric and my dad were like a little relief um, Scott was very instrumental though in me breaking the record by as much as I did um, what was really important was those times when he went in and took some load off the other guys but from Davenport Gap which is before the Smokies uh, there's a 31 mile section of nothing. Um, so I'll just explain this a little bit, but Eric walked in 10 miles with me, muled in me water. So when I get 10 miles in, I, my water was gone. He gave me more stuff and I took off. He went back. Scott came in. So just like a remote aid station. Like a remote aid station, pretty much. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. And then Scott came from the other direction, about 10 miles in, and did the same thing. So it was like two tens, no big deal. Once Scott got out to Newfound Gap, which is the gap in Smokies, he drove all the way down and around, hiked in four miles with my bag, my pad, my tent, 
and we went to this shelter and I, you know, I connected with him after going over Clingman's Dome, 56 miles that day, and he laid down my, my, my bed. Jen, now getting back to Jen, she slept at Clingman's Dome. So now I'm 15 miles ahead of Jen again, right? At Devonport Gap, we both slept there. So that was a huge day, a huge jump on what she had, you know, where she was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Scott, that one day was huge because Eric and my dad were not hiking in my stuff. Um, and it was, that, that leg is 33 miles. Um, without car support so that was a huge day and he was just fired up you know he just brought it in like what you know what do you need you didn't really ask him what i need we put a small list together as we walked along and he had just the minimal stuff that we needed i got out of there at 5 a.m and i went out he hiked out and he went to atlanta flew to new york he had a meeting yeah <laughs> and he flew back to atlanta the next day really and came back and then and then he was like right back on it you know he had my truck so he left my truck at the airport so bing bing he was in and out and then he came back and then uh he was like right back on it again and he's like you still a trail looks like you, you know he's just da -da 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 -da. and i'm like killer you know and then the last day he went the last 30 miles with me and that was that was the best time because he and i talk about old times and talk about stuff that yeah. nobody you know it's just it's just friend friendship stuff yeah. um talk about old races and what's going on now it's not all about it wasn't really all about running either just you know friends family uh, life yeah just life uh, but that was great because it took my mind off you know, just running. I was just running along and everything felt fine, you know. Um, Dave Horton showed up at the last minute. He drove all the way from Arkansas. He was at a, he had to be in Arkansas for something and he drove 11 hours, got out of his car, parks at the parking lot with like 20, we have like 12 miles to go to Springer. Dave Horton jumps out, he's like, I'm gonna run with him. Someone take my car to the next spot. And, <laughs> <laughs> and someone was able to do that because there were some Red Bull crew people there and stuff. So they were able to take his car. Dave starts walking with us. Half a mile, Dave crashes, smashes his arm. He's all bloody. <laughs> and Dave, he goes, I know where I'm going. He goes, I'm going to go out to the road and walk up to the thing. And I'm thinking, like, it's dark out. I mean, I'm like, we're in the Georgia woods, just dark. And Horton's over there on some road walking. I'm like, well, did you know where he's going? What? He knew where he was going. But uh, that was pretty funny. I mean, little shit happened like that. But Scott was, I mean, he was just fired up to help you know like I was when I helped him too and it was just like it's great to have the guy that holds the record I mean to help you out like that it was just pretty inspirational now the last time you were going for it in 2014 Jennifer Farr Davis had the record right so did you have any contact with her uh, she graduated and it was over okay. um, we had more contact with her husband Brew um, yeah. in Maine Brew dumped it uh, Brew bumped into my dad at the grocery store in Maine in Millinocket uh just randomly. Jen was up there doing something at the top, some hiking thing. So, Brew bumps into my dad, and then Brew also brought us some beer in North Carolina uh, near at one near Asheville. So, uh, that was cool. I didn't really, I never saw Jen though. Yeah. I mean, she didn't congratulate me, which was cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool to have all of us kind of, you know, I don't know Jen very well or anything, yeah. but uh, it's cool to be sort of friend and stuff. It's all, it's all good, you know. It's a community. It's a community. Now, you said Brew brought you some beer. Uh, did you have any, you didn't have a lot of surprise people on the trail, but did anybody just bring you any food? Or did you have any like hiker just be like, oh, I got this brownie, it's awesome. <laughs> Anything, um, any like food that like just surprised you? And You know, it's not, not Dave Horton was, Dave, Dave knew where he was. He had a login so he could follow daily. Uh, a few people had that. Um, he brought his classic uh, bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he watched.